I thought of something once. If there are so many values about demographics, army, health, wealth, tensions, the political state, and so on, of all the countries in the world to take into account, or to, t to make an afar series which would be the most realistic, then that's not mapping. Mappers do very few researches on their subjects most of the time and just make random stories, all just for fun. Mapping isn't about a big project which is goal would be the most realistic political projection. Yet, it isn't only about a, a bunch of teens posting random stuff for fun either. Well, that's judgeable. Mapping is all about finding interest in a, about a region, a country, taking all the information that you can or not, and make people want to know more about it. It is truly really this community that made me amazed about geography through interest. As before discovering it, I still didn't find the use to learn about it, and a history geography class was just extenuatedly boring. Happy I got here! But anyways, here's your video, and don't forget it is from 2012, so back before mapping was even a thing. I know I shouldn't be crying about it, but it's pretty sad that, that all of us 600 mappers weren't able to do as good of an FR episode in 2 years as this guy did with his team in 2 weeks. Here is the second part that the below the maps consacres to the future of the conflicts in the world. At first we analyze the reasons for the, of the rivalities around the resources and today we are going to find where are the regions where tensions and war can happen using the parameters and the problematics that we already know in 2012. And as you will see, the exercise of simulation on changes of the frontiers is pretty interesting. The last French report, with the goal to help on a decision and with subject, security and national defense, identifies an arch of crisis from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. Inside of this arch of crisis, we find these countries in conflict in Sahel with the tensions in Western Sahara or the border between Algeria and Niger, in the African Horn with the conflicts in Sudan and Somalia, in Eastern Maghreb with the instabilities after the Arab Spring, in Mashrik with the contestations in Syria, the civil war in Iraq and the Israelo-Palestinian conflict in the Arab Peninsula, with the revolutions in Yemen or the revolts in Bahrain. And there is Iran, which isn't in conflict, but which is a factor of tensions. And finally, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and in northern India. No cultural, no political entity in this group, but the approach is to make the links appear between these conflicts, their order, like in a puzzle, and the consequences they can have in a larger scale. So which way do we go? First off, let's see the region covering the Near Orient, Iraq and Iran. The fall of the Syrian Malawian Empire could modify loads of balances in the Near Orient, with consequences on the Israelo-Palestinian conflict, on the deblocking of the syro israelian relations, on the Golan or Lebanon Israelian, with negotiations on a peace treaty with Lebanon. And every modification of those balances will depend on the Iranian government, principal opponent of Israel in the region. The weight of the Helan will be deci decisionful in the Israelian conflicts, the re in relation with Syria with the Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Hamas in Palestine. 
The state of Israel with its nuclear weapons is already an accomplished fact. But the Iranian accession of those same weapons could this time drive to a, way, a race of weapon accession in the Middle Orient, especially for the Sunni regimes, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, who doubt on the counterbalance of those forces faced to the Shiite power. At the West, in Iraq, the following of the conflicts between Shiite and Sunni could maintain the country in civil war, leading the Iraqi and Sunni to escape to Syria or Jordan. Let's follow this hypothesis with a simulation. The three provinces majoritarily populated of Sunni Arabs would join Syria. The Shiites of southern Iraq would be a Shiite state allied with Iran on the coast of the Persian Gulf. We can also conceive an autonomous territory for the Kurds set off in Iraq, Turkey and Iran. Iran would then lose zones at the west to the profit of an independent Kurdistan and would extend its territory in Afghanistan around the city of Herat, justifying it by the cultural and historical affinities with Persia. Let's continue this logic of breaking up the countries by imagining an excuse for breaking everything to the neighbor Pakistan. Kiber Pakhtunkhwa, always little govern, will stay the source of transfrontalia instabilities between Afghanistan and Pakistan. The Pashtun could challenge this border of the Mortimer to run and create this independent Pashtunistan which they dream of since the 1950s which is bad for the Pakistanis, Puljabi, and the Tajik Afghans. So another consequence as the South, the Baloch spread on Iran, Afghanistan and Pakistan would fight the Pakistani central power and could establish an independent Balochistan, which the capital be, would become Gwadar, a strategic port financed by the Chinese, which has been first talked about in a previous episode. So, of course, all of this is just an exercise of anticipation, or simply an imaginary one. But if this domino run would need to intervene, the effects was, would rise over the, this initial geographic scale, notably because China, situated at the border of this crisis arch, has energetic needs which drives it to build a real strategy towards the Oman Sea, to reduce the transport costs by boats to the Arab hydrocarbide through Pakistan and the port of Qadar and through the Central Asia as to the 2030 horizon Central Asia will be at the heart of an intense competition to the excess of oil and gas which we see here the principal reservoirs the development of the resources at, of Caspia continues, making the paths of extraction more complex. Russia could lose influence in Central Asia from I Iran and Turkey, which will want to misdirect transports of the hydrocarbide towards their network, which is bad for Moscow and, f and, and from Asian countries, notably China. For example, in Kazakhstan, back then a Soviet Republic, the Chinese enterprises now hold 20% of the oil production. In plus, the Uyghur populations are found everywhere around their border, in the western margins of China. The Chinese living in Kazakhstan could let Pekin better control, starting from the northwest, this independent ethnic group. In 2030, these Central Asian countries could enter in Chinese sphere even more, at least economically, and for Moscow, such a situation for its eastern regions could either stronger its diplomatic isolation or even put Russia itself in this crisis arch. Because let's add that, in 2030, 
Russia will also have lost its capacity to control its near stranger at the west. Azerbaijan and Armenia will have gotten closer to the EU and Turkey, Ukraine and Georgia could join NATO or even the EU for Ukraine. The dictatorship in Belarus could encounter the same faith as those in Arabia. So with the presence of a Central Asia more Sino-centered, at one side, a Ukraine and a Belarus gone European at another, Moscow could feel it is encircled, which could lead to military intervention like that in Georgia in 2008. So what could the consequences be in Oriental Siberia? There, the population coming from China at the northeast immigrates, attracted by the employment in the industrial region of Irkutsk, while the Russians immigrate to the west. Eastern Siberia could then become a zone of conflicts and tensions precisely around Irkutsk, an entry point to the Siberian resources, as in place of these big reservoirs we see here, Gold, iron, rare ores, copper, nickel, Eastern Siberia could, has coal, oil, and huge reservoirs of natural gas. A lot of those aren't exploited because they aren't invested, as they are in a region where extraction is difficult. And yet from 2030, Eastern Siberia could, in fact, because, uh, become an important producer of gas. So we now understand the growing weight of Pekin at the borders to Russia, from Caspia to the eastern Siberia. And to finish, let's look at the coast of China and beyond in Eastern Asia. It is a region where there still are territorial conflicts that aren't resolved in Oriental and Meridional Chinese seas between China, Vietnam, Philippines and Japan. There is the instabilities in, in Korea with the questions about nuclear weapons and, and unification. There is the, the independence growth in Taiwan. And to those territorial conflicts, there are identity factors like in Taiwan or, really, or religious ones like in Indonesia, in Malaysia or at the Philippines. Summing up, if we play our domino game, we notice an extension of our initial crisis arch towards the east. Now, what is it for Africa? Each region of the continent will develop with its near outside more than towards the center of the continent. By such, the African Horn, Somalia, Ethiopia and Eritrea links to the crisis arch by the arch by the Arab Peninsula is already fully integrated to it. And recent developments make us think that a contagion is possible more in the south of Africa, notably towards the two Sudans. The big conflicts in Africa could stay independent from one another as they are often linked to the strategic interests of the big pools outside, like the US, China, the EU or Russia. It is by such few probable to go through a domino phenomena similar to that of the arch crisis in 2030. So what you just saw right now on the maps is only an exercise, a simulation, it doesn't planify anything to the f or for the future, but when we want to think, it is also important to go through this kind of method. If we make a synthesis of what the American agency estimates for the future it is, the grown importance of the information, the irregular informations on the capacities of the army, and the importance of the non-military dimension of the conflicts. But anyway, for the future, the frontiers will be more and more imprecise or gone over. 
sur ce thème, vous pouvez lire euh, le livre de Gaïd Minassian aux éditions Autrement quand les États perdent le contrôle. Vous pouvez lire le livre blanc sur la défense et la sécurité nationale dont je vous parlais aux éditions Odile Jacob et la documentation française. Les cahiers du Quai d'Orsay ont publié dans leur livraison de l'automne 2011 « Espoir et défi des révolutions arabes ». Et puis euh, une histoire critique du XXe siècle édité en France mais aussi en langue allemande. Et je vous rappelle la parution chez Arte Édition et Talendier de nos itinéraires géopolitiques.